So what I'm going to do tonight is based upon the events leading up to and including the cross, we can find hope even when things seem hopeless. The first thing that we need to do is this. We need to pay attention because there is always hope. We need to pay attention because there is always hope. I'm going to direct your attention to Matthew 26, verses 17 through 19. If you can't, if this is too small of a font for you, we do have Bibles here, and you can look on your Bible app on your phone as well. But I'll read it to you. It says this. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed him and them, and they prepared the Passover. So basically, now what's going on is Jesus and his disciples were going to get together to celebrate Passover. Now, if you're not familiar with Passover, basically it was a celebration of what the Lord did in Egypt with, the, with God's people as they were being released from Egypt. So basically, the tenth plague was the plague of the firstborn. Some of you remember this. And the, the Israelites were actually told by God to sacrifice the Passover lamb or sacrifice a lamb, put the blood on the door mantle, And when this plague of the firstborn was going to come into Egypt, the the spirit would actually pass over any of the doors that there was the blood of the lamb on the mantle. Now, here's what happened. The, The plague happened and the spirit did pass over those doors where the blood was painted on. So the people were passed over. They were protected because of the blood of the sacrificed lamb. But now, here's what I want to do. I want to jump to what happened next. So they were celebrating Passover, and then we go to the Lord's Supper, so, or the Last Supper. It says this, Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it anew with you in my father's kingdom. So now what's happening here is if the disciples were paying close attention, they would have realized that Jesus, what Jesus was actually communicating through this Passover feast, that he, in fact, was the Passover lamb, okay? He was the lamb that that was going to protect them, that was going to actually be delivered up for their sake. So he was teaching them that he was the once and for all Passover lamb that would take away the sins of the world and would be the hope of the world, like Matthew 12 says, in his name, the nation's Put their hope. So now think about this for a second. In a hopeless situation, if these disciples were actually paying close attention to what was going on, all of a sudden they would see hope. So, I mean, obviously it's easy for us now looking back to say, how did they not see what was going on? Okay? It's so easy for us because we know the entirety of the account. But for the disciples at this time, they were just looking and saying, okay, let's celebrate Passover with Jesus. And Jesus celebrated Passover with them and then did something that nobody really did at Passover, which was to observe the Lord's Supper when he said, take and eat, this is my body, take and drink, this is my blood. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like you to grab your little communion cup, your elements there, and I want to... Take the time to actually observe what Jesus and his disciples were observing at that time. Now, at this time when Jesus said this, he said, take eat, this is my body. So he was saying this because he was actually foreshadowing what was going to be laid down for their sins. 
Now, we as believers realize that communion is a very special time because it is for believers. It's for those who believe that Jesus is their Savior. And what we're doing is we're remembering the fact that Jesus did, in fact, lay down his life for us. That Jesus' blood was, in fact, shed for us on that cross. That Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice, the once-for-all Passover lamb for us, on our behalf, in our place, for our sin. So when we observe communion, we're remembering that. But another thing that we're doing when we observe communion is we're actually evaluating our own life. In 1 Corinthians, it talks about it, that. It says, as a Christian, when you come to the Lord's table, you have to examine your own life. The reason why you examine your life is because we know, as Christians, we still sin. We're forgiven of our sin, but we still actually do it. That's why Paul said in Romans 7, remember, he says, oh, the things that I don't want to do, those are the things that I actually do, okay? He, he talks about the struggle that we as believers have, our struggle with sin. And basically, communion is a great time for us to actually say, you know what? I'm struggling with this sin. I'm continuing down the wrong road, the road that is away from God rather than the road that is towards him. I'm continuing down that road, and I don't want to continue down that road any longer. So communion is a time for a believer to say, you know what? Enough's enough. I'm turning it over to you, God. I'm asking you to give me victory because I can't have victory on my own. So what I'd like to do before we partake of the elements is I'd like to give you a few moments just of silence that you can actually come to the Lord and confess any sins that you may have been struggling with. Maybe it's in the past week, maybe something that you've been struggling with for years. Bring it to the Lord. Ask him for victory. So I'm just going to give you a few moments of silence, and then we'll partake together. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. He said, take, eat. This is my body given up for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then after supper, Jesus took the cup. He said, drink of it, all of you, for this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Now, so this happened at the Last Supper. And after that, Jesus went to the garden to pray. So let's see what happens. It says this in Matthew 26, verse 47. It says, while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man. Seize him. And he came up to Jesus and at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. They came, came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? 
But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled? That it must be so. At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, have you come out against the, out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day, I sat in the temple teaching you, and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. So here's what's happening. There's now this seemingly hopeless situation, right? So the Last Supper happens. Jesus does this bizarre thing. You know, he says, this is my body, this is my blood. Then he goes out to pray, and Judas brings a mob, and Judas is betraying him, and the mob takes, him off. It takes Jesus over. Peter is the one with the sword. He jumps out and says, no, no, not on my watch. Remember, he's the one that's like, no, I'm not going to deny you. I'm going to protect you, Jesus, this and that. Cuts off his ear. I mean, this is mind-blowing to me because this guy gets his ear cut off. Jesus heals him right in front of everybody. They still take Jesus away. How is this possible, okay? How is this possible? Well, I'll tell you how it's possible. Because Jesus said, this is actually the plan. Don't you think I could just have my father call legions of angels and save me from this mess? Save me from this plan that I don't like? Because remember, in the garden, what did he pray? He didn't say, okay, it's all good, I'm ready. He actually said, Father, if it's possible, take this cup from me. But not my will, thy will be done. So in a seemingly hopeless situation, Jesus basically says, this needs to happen. Which brings us to our next point. Because sometimes when we have a seemingly hopeless situation, we have to do this. We have to remember that God is in control. God is in control, or in other words, God has a plan. Okay, we say this all the time, right? God's in control, God has a plan. God's in control, God has a plan. And we say it, right, because it's true. And we say it because... We want to believe it, right? But you know what? We need to say it because it is true, and we do believe it. See, the plan for Jesus to be betrayed, arrested, and taken away, and eventually crucified seemed hopeless, but knowing that it was all part of God's plan gave us hope. I think about this a lot. You know, we, I say this often, too. Like, we're on the other side of the cross. We see things clearly. We see things that, you know, Think about what these disciples were going through. Did you notice at the end it said they fled? And you're like, cowards, okay, they all ran, right? Can you imagine what these disciples were going through? They left everything to follow Jesus. Jesus said, come on, you're not a fisherman anymore. You're doing this. You're not going to have a home anymore. You're coming and follow me. All of a sudden, after three years of following this guy, an angry mob comes and arrests him, and he says, I'll go. Could you imagine what they were going through. Jesus himself did not want Peter to stand in the way because all that was happening was part of the master plan. Now, oftentimes when things happen that seem hopeless, we get discouraged. We wonder what God is doing. We wonder why God allows it. These are common, normal questions. If you read the Psalms, you see that, right? What's going on here, God? Okay, what's the plan? I want to know the plan right now, okay? We all feel that way. We wish we knew the answers to all the questions, and because we don't have the answers, things actually seem hopeless. So here's what we do. We do what Peter did. We try to take matters into our own hands. I'm going to control this. I'm going to do this. Instead of stopping and listening to God and stopping and praying, we say, I need to step in because if I don't, then nothing's going to happen. It's not that we shouldn't act or react, but we need to remember that if it is part of God's plan, guess what? You can't stand in the way of it. Peter couldn't. I mean, he was the tough guy who drew his sword. And what did Jesus do? He's like, okay, you cut that guy's ear off. Guess what? Here's one up. I'm, I'm healing him, okay? The ear is going back. Okay, you're not doing this. So what if God's plan includes something that seems hopeless, like it seemed hopeless to the disciples when Jesus was being taken away? Now, this brings us to our final point, and this is a longer point, so you're thinking, wow, it's final point already? Okay, it's a longer point. Okay, 
we have to know that suffering actually has a purpose. Suffering actually has a purpose. You see, the account of the cross is the best example in all of Scripture that suffering has a purpose. Would you agree with that? The account, I mean, think about the account of the cross. And we're going to go through the account of the cross. But think about just at the very beginning, the father gives up his son. Okay? If you're a parent, you don't have to stretch too far to realize how hard that was. Okay? The father giving up his son. Okay? The father sacrificing his son, allowing his child to go through what we're about to really witness. So what we're going to do is we're going to study through Isaiah 53, which is a prophecy written about 700 years before Jesus came to earth. I want you to think about that for a second. These words that I'm going to share with you were written 700 years before Jesus even came to the earth. Think about that for a second and how accurate it really is. So let's look. Isaiah 53 starts off. Who has believed that he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of the dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. So it starts off, right? It talks about Jesus growing up. Then it says he had no form or majesty that we should be drawn to him. No beauty. Basically, it's saying Jesus the God of this universe would be an average looking guy, okay? An average looking guy would come to this earth. Then it goes on, say, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. So now what's happening here, he's talking about like the, the suffering death. But not only that, the suffering life. You know, there's a passage where Jesus says the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. See, Jesus wasn't, wasn't he was actually used to suffering. Okay? His life actually had suffering before the cross. Then it says this, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. So now we're starting to see the picture of the cross. Okay, what Jesus actually endured, what he actually took upon himself, the fact that he took all of our sin upon himself. And when Jesus was on that cross, you remember the account, right? People spit at him. They mocked him. When he was going up to be crucified, they called him names. They wagged their head at him. They looked at him and said, pretty much, what a waste. He's dying like a criminal would die. That's what was going on. Goes on, says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. That's sins. He was crushed for our iniquity. Again, sins. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. Now, this is interesting because basically what this is talking about is sin needs to be paid for. People do not like to hear this, okay? People do not like to hear, you are accountable for your actions. People like to say, well, it's no big deal, okay? Do whatever you feel like doing, and it's not going to matter. But here's what happens. We are actually accountable for our sins. Do you know that if Jesus doesn't pay the price for our sins, do you know who has to? Okay? Not your parents. You have to. Okay, you have to pay for your sins. But Jesus was willing to take our punishment in our place for our sins. So that's why we as Christians, you know, we come here and I was actually thinking this when I was singing like the wonderful cross. The world. It basically, and you probably heard some other pastors say this too, it would be like if we were worshiping an electric chair. Okay, could you imagine if you came into a building and they're like, there's pictures of an electric chair everywhere. It's a device to kill people. That's the Roman cross. It was a device to kill people, and it's become a centerpiece of Christian worship. Why? Because of what happened on it. 
because he was paying the price for our sins. It should have been us, but it was him. So then it goes on to say, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. So what this is saying, this is talking about our nature. We like sheep have gone astray. And when I see sheep there, okay, like when I think of, a sh when I think of sheep, I don't think of something like that's like mean, right? I think of something that's kind of like a little dim. <laughs> think about it for a second. Think about it. So when I think of like maybe like a mad dog or something, I'm like, okay, that dog, like let's get rid of that dog. Like here's, we're like sheep. In some senses, we commit sin, and sometimes we're even so ignorant of our own sin. We don't mean harm necessarily, but we still sin. So think about this for a second, because I know a lot of people say this, well, you know, but what about a good person? What about a good person? Guess what? There is no good people. We are all sinners. Some of us might be just like innocent sheep, seeming like we didn't do anything wrong. We're just kind of dumbly going into sin, okay? Doing the wrong thing. But we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us have turned to our own way, meaning we're selfish. I think we can all agree. We can all agree on this. We are all, all a little bit selfish sometimes, aren't we? Think about it. Think about your day. Think about your life. I mean, let's be honest. We're all a little bit selfish. And, he, and, and God's saying, even though that describes you, he was willing to take your sin. He was willing to take the punishment. So then it goes on. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Think about this, okay? 700 years before Jesus, Jesus was getting whipped. I mean, it always gets me. I probably say this every Good Friday. It always gets me when he's on the cross and they're like, he can't even save himself. And I'm like, man, if I was Jesus, I would come down and punch that guy, okay? Because it makes me angry, right? Think about it. He didn't even open up his mouth. And he had control. He could have crushed that guy's head, okay? He could have did whatever he wanted. It says like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before a shearer is a silent. He, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? It's going on, saying, like, this is how people were seeing him. Oh, he must, he must be punished by God. Okay, he must have did something wrong. Okay, there's other criminals there, too. He must have did something wrong. Whatever it was, it must have been really bad. He must deserve what's going on. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death. Think about this. His grave with the wicked, meaning he was died a criminal's death. So he died like a wicked man would die. And with the rich man in his death. Remember, Joseph of Arimathea took him to the tomb that he bought. Okay? And although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was all, what? The will, or we can insert, plan of the Lord to crush him. This was part of the seemingly hopeless plan when Jesus was taken away under arrest in the dark of night and everybody fled. It's part of God's will, part of his plan. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, ours, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days and the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. 700 years before Christ, the righteous one, right? My servant, make many us to be accounted righteous. Remember what we talked about in Romans six or seven years ago, right? He took our sin and gave us what? His righteousness. Think about this. And he shall bear their iniquities. Talking about our sins. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. 
because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. So basically he's saying he bore our sin. He bore the sin of many. He looked at that point like he was dying a deserved death as a criminal. But what he in fact was doing was dying in our place for our sins. So Jesus' suffering had a specific purpose. And I know that you probably feel the same way I do. I am so glad, okay? I am so glad. His purpose was to save us. Jesus suffered so we would not have to suffer when? For eternity. But you know what? You may be suffering in a way that you can't connect dots like this. I mean, these dots that were connected were years and years, 700 before Jesus, and actually it even goes right back to creation, okay? We see the cross in creation. So we can connect the dots. We know this suffering had a huge purpose. But now you might be sitting here tonight saying, I'm suffering and I can't connect the dots. If you're saying to me, suffering has purpose, I'm suffering right now, and I cannot connect the dots. What is the real purpose of this suffering? Well, I wish I could tell you how to connect those dots. I wish I could tell you what specifically for your situation is going on, but I can't. But I can tell you a few things. When we suffer, the first is there is something to be learned. Let's look at Romans 5. It says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces what? Hope. Remember this seemingly hopeless situation? And now the suffering is producing endurance, and the endurance produces character, and the character produces hope. Some of you might realize this in life, that some of the most character-enduring and hope-filled situations in your life came out of a suffering time of your life. Because then it says this, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So what he's saying here is, hey, listen, there's something to be learned, and what's to be learned is this. You put your hope in God. That's where it needs to be. So whatever the suffering is, you have to say, well, you know, where is my hope? Is my hope in this world? Is my hope in the medical profession? Is my hope in my bank account? Is my hope in whatever you might be putting your hope in? And let me just tell you, all those things will eventually fail. And some of you are saying, not my bank account. Okay, that's not going to fail. It can and will fail. The only place where we really can find hope is in God. And he's poured out that hope through his Holy Spirit into our lives. Scriptures teach us that when you believe that Jesus is your Savior, you not only receive eternal life, but you actually receive the Holy Spirit so that when you're suffering, you can actually find hope. Because the Spirit's like, I'm giving you hope. I'm helping you out here. I'm getting you through. Next, here's next what we can do. When we suffer, we can still do good. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Here's the, here's, here's the issue that we have as Christians, right? A lot of times when we're suffering, we have to stop, okay? We're like, I can't do anything. I can't do anything. I just have to suffer. I just have to be like, woe is me. I can't move on because I'm suffering and I can't keep going. But what this passage is telling us is, hey, listen, if you're suffering... Part of God's plan might be that you're suffering. You still look for opportunities to do good. You still look and say, you know what? How can God use me in this situation? And finally, and this is my favorite one, and it always has been, when we suffer, we're reminded this world is not our home. This world is not our home. I love this verse in Hebrews. For we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Okay? This world's not our home. Okay? We're just pilgrims passing through. We have no lasting city here. Granted, 
we're probably cr pretty comfortable at some points in our life. Maybe you're very comfortable right now. Maybe things are just great, and I'm glad for you. But you know what? You and I will never be 100% comfortable in this world. We just won't. We will never be 100% comfortable in this world. So when we see suffering, when suffering happens, when things happen, we're just reminded, oh, yeah, that's right. I'm not made for this world. I mean, we think 80 years is a long time, right? I mean, 80 years seems like a long time. Some of you here that are 80 are like, well, it doesn't seem that long, okay? <laughs> 80 years seems like a long time. But the scriptures actually say it's just like a mist in comparison to eternity. And do you know what? If we don't trust in Jesus, things are not going to be good. But when we do trust in Jesus, we know there's a city that's to come that's going to be so much better. We're not going to have to suffer. We're not going to have to deal with hopeless situations. Because we hope in the one who made that city, who lives in that city, and who's going to bring us to that city, heaven, together, one day, we'll all experience that. So on this Good Friday, when we look at the cross, we see hope. We don't see a hopeless situation. We see hope. 